Today we continue our brief, short series in the book of Revelation, and we pick up in chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. Hear the word of God. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll and even look inside. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll and look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled, by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and he took the scroll from the right hand of the one who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased us for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders found, fell down and worshipped. This is the word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? Our Lord, our God, be with us in this moment as we hear your word. Lord God, help us to listen for your voice, to hear what your Holy Spirit has for us this day, that we ourselves might be buoyed in our faith. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Surprising and somewhat disorienting. If you've ever looked at one of those 3D image pictures, you know the one that you have to look at and stare at for a while, and then finally, if you're lucky, the image starts coming forward and you begin to see more and more detail, the way that you need to relax your eyes to focus on that image can be disorienting sometimes, and often the image that you see and the new details in there can be surprising. Surprising and disorienting. 
is what I imagine John is feeling as he has been swept up in the spirit, taken up to heaven. If you remember the lesson from last week, it described this throne room that John had been taken up into. And I imagine that he continues to be surprised by the visions, disoriented by what he is seeing. He is in a throne room with God the Creator. He is in God's presence and all the splendid characters who surround the throne, the elders and the creatures and the beasts, and it brings into sharp focus through these symbols the realities of John's day of life under Roman imperialism. If you remember, John's vision takes some of these secular images from his day and uses them to help believers see clearly the story of God's redeeming love for creation. John is taking images that would have been common to those reading this book for the first time and uses them as he tells again the story of God's redeeming love and his restoration plans for creation. We, with John, as we read this scripture, are in that throne room with God, with the brilliant light in all directions, soothing symbols of restoration and transformation, and angelic beings turning toward God in worship. And in this throne room, the one God sits on the throne, and in his right hand is the future. But the disheartening question is who is worthy to reveal God's will? This detailed imagery of this scroll with writing on both sides acknowledges that it is rich in substance. Normally in a scroll you only wrote on one side, but there was so much detail to this particular scroll. It was written on both sides and that would tell the audience reading this and hearing it for the first time that it is rich in substance. And the seven seals confirms its completeness in its contents. Numerology for these first century believers was big, it was huge. They knew what it meant to have seven seals. Seven is the number of completeness. It is the sum of three, the divine, Three often represents the divine. It's the sum of three and four. Four signifying the wholeness of creation. All the ends of the earth. Three and four. Seven. The number of completeness. God in his right hand has a scroll rich in substance and complete in his will. And no one is worthy that they can find. Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one on heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open and look into it. John begins to weep. But then he is given the good news that there is somebody who is worthy. And all is not lost. But to his astonishing surprise, the one who is worthy to reveal God's will is not what he expected. And in a moment of shock and confusion, a moment when John was probably experiencing a sense of disorientation, the moment when he expects a lion 
to emerge a symbol of strength and of power, a symbol of the royal line of David, a symbol of the Messiah, John turns to see not a lion, but a lamb. And not just any lamb, a slaughtered lamb, a sacrificed lamb, a lamb that was wounded but not dead. The signs of a suffering and, a, and death are still visible. This is the image of Christ crucified. But in this image, this is where the true power of God lies. This is power manifest in what was seemingly weakness. It was if John was watching performance art. I don't know if any of you have seen performance art on YouTube or at any event that you have attended, but a few years ago, Alan and I were attending an AIDS fundraiser, and we watched in awe a performance artist who came up, it was during the auction, and to music grabbed several paintbrushes and started painting with broad strokes of color in random, it seemed just so random. And he danced around and he splashed these colors on this canvas and then even took his hands and started, it was like a piece of modern art. I was like, oh, I'm not going to understand this, <laughs> right? I am not going to get this, you know? And he's up there and he's dancing and, and, and performing and, and splashing color. And then when he finished, he stepped back and he took this image that he had and he turned it upside down. And it was the face of Christ. My heart skipped a beat. I can still feel the swelling of my heart as I describe that event. If you've not ever seen it, go on YouTube, watch it. It is amazing. He takes a picture and he turns it upside down. That has got to be what John is feeling. Things just got inverted. They were turned upside down and he sees the face of Christ. Can you imagine John standing in that throne room expecting to see a lion, but instead seeing a lamb, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, his heart skipping a beat, pounding and swelling. John has stepped through the looking glass. He sees things differently from a new perspective, from a new perspective. <clears throat> He sees what is expected now has been turned upside down and inside out. Because Roman ideology says that salvation comes through conquest and prosperity. Emperors co conquered and they dominated and they subjugated the people who were forced to worship the emperor. Christ inverts that notion. How does Christ win the victory? By delivering, by redeeming, by setting free. That becomes the ultimate victory, not a victory of subjugation, but of redemption, of giving a sense of dignity, by giving a sense of identity in God's kingdom. The life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ turns the Roman secular notions of salvation upside down and inside out. How often do we expect a lion from God but get a lamb? We think somehow that our salvation may come by way of human government through our culture of prosperity and material wealth and security. How often are we tempted to keep climbing that ladder of prosperity 
only to be disoriented in the reminders that in God's kingdom, for God's salvation, God's redemption is coming through a slaughtered lamb who confronts the status quo. This chapter and its previous chapters, the beginning of Revelation, is set up to be comforting. These chapters were meant to be comforting to those who were reading them before the seals are broken because when those seals are broken, the images will be terrifying. The contents of the scrolls is what keeps us up at night sometimes thinking about Revelation. It's what we most identify Revelation with. It's where the scary and the stereotypical fiery preaching comes from. When I was growing up as a high schooler, we used to go to Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. Anyone been there? All right. Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, Chuck Smith. Oh my gosh, he would bring the fire on Friday nights. And if you weren't a believer when you walked through those doors, by gosh, you were when you were going out. Because they take the images, those scary, terrifying images of Revelation and try to scare us into faith. But that is not what John is trying to do. John is bringing words of comfort and ultimately of unexpected strength through a slaughtered lamb. Every geopolitical age since the resurrection has read itself into Revelation. Every natural disaster, every dictator who rises to power, we overlay onto Revelation. But chapter 5 is meant to disorient us, but in a way that reminds us that God is in control. God is the one with his future in his right hand. And the death of Christ was the way that God's power is unleashed. It is the power of self-sacrifice that builds the kingdom by redeeming every people from every tribe and nation. Salvation for the first century believers was not coming from the Roman Empire. Nor is salvation coming from our modern culture. John's apocalypse was an expose. That's what the root words for apocalypse apocalypse means. It's a revealing. Just like Toto revealed Oz by pulling back the curtain. John's apocalypse pulls back the curtain. It's an expose. It is uncovering the truth about the Roman Empire. Rome is exposed as not the great eternal power it claims to be, and it must not be worshipped. Revelation calls people to choose between worship of God or worship of the empire against the backdrop of the Roman ideology and the propaganda the angels thousands and thousands and ten thousands and ten thousands of angels break forth in singing a new song a song of jubilation a song of new found certainty The struggles are not yet over. There's no claim that the struggles are over, but those singing those songs believe God has the last and the final word. Even in times of pain and of struggle, we are called upon to sing a new song. In this very room, every Sunday, we share with one another the pains and the struggles that we are confronting, the prayers that we ask for, for those who we know who are suffering. We come and we do that, and 
in our confidence, in our newfound confidence and security in God, we know that we can sing songs of joy. Worship penetrates the present darkness and transforms it into a world where God's vision is realized. Worship brings songs of hope in a hopeless world of terrorism, of anxieties, of depression, of cancer, of wars, of hunger, of poverty. To sing songs of worship about the Lamb is to join in the heavenly chorus that is going on right now. So let us together not transfix on the anxiety that can come from daily living, but instead let us grab on to the certainty that God gives us through his son Jesus Christ, who is the lamb slain and where the true power lives. Because we know the end of the story. We know that in the end, God does prevail. So when we are facing our own tribulation, John wants us to remember the throne room where it is Jesus Christ who will prevail and his who is worthy. Amen. Amen.